Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Terribly excited to join you uh, on the first start of your, your day as the caffeine kicks in and the, uh, and the breakfast do too. Um, today, I'm going to take you through machine learning and the perfect job match. Um, so for us at read.co.uk, this journey started around six years or so ago when we hired uh, a lady called Roxana, who was our first ever data scientist. I think it speaks volumes how far we've come that in that time, I don't think data scientists are unusual anymore, but certainly at the time it was a bit of a, a head spinner. Um, Roxana came with uh, plenty of knowledge. She was a doctor of science, uh, and she also had a fabulous surname. She was uh, Roxana Danger, so she was, in fact, Dr. Danger, which, if you're easy to please as I am, I think that's pretty cool, and she was pretty cool. Um, and I guess the, the kind of culmination of those six years is that we now have a data science team in-house at read.co.uk with the sole purpose of crunching all of the data that we sit on, because at read.co.uk we sit on a lot of data, whether that be candidate data, whether that be job um, information, and whether that be recruiter information too. So it's how do we use that information to our advantage for both our candidates and our recruiters. Um, you may have noticed, the eagle-eyed amongst you might have noticed, that I'm in fact not a data scientist, and I apologise for that. I'm in fact a research marketing exec at read.co.uk. Um, we wanted one of the data scientist guys to be up here presenting for you today, but they're actually at a pivotal stage with what I'm going to be taking you through. Um, so hence why I'm here in their stead. Um, but fear not, we worked on the presentation together, so I'm hopeful that I can do, uh, do it proud and do it service. So what we are going to cover in our very short presentation today, uh, we wanted to show you guys and take you guys under the hood of, of what we've done at Reader UK in terms of how we've applied machine learning to a real business problem. Um, so we're going to be talking about reducing the ambiguity of our sectors. Um, we'll take you through that again uh, in a short amount of time. There's also a lot in here about how we've improved our data quality, which is an essential component to the, search, the job search process, but also the candidate match process too. We're also going to be talking about using machine learning to reduce subjectivity and bias, which I'm sure we all know and can all appreciate that that is a really key strength for AI and automation. And finally, there's a piece in here around reducing the amount of explicit data collection from users. So how can you create a better and more positive candidate experience by understanding um, learning patterns uh, and in initializing that in the, the job search journey? So here, if you go on to read.co.uk today and you click on our sectors tab at the, uh, the top navigation, you'll see our 38 top level sectors. And that's been the case more or less since when read.co.uk first started. Now, this has served us well, um, it, it's done its job, but in terms of uh, the best candidate experience, it's not best suited, and there's several reasons for that. I guess, in the first instance, it's a very manual process, and there's been a lot of human decision-making in terms of defining what these 38 sectors are. And therefore, there has to be a lot of human creation in terms of making sure all of the sectors are up-to-date as and where possible. So this is the, the, the kind of challenge that we're facing. How do we improve upon this almost arbitrary 38-sector model? And to kind of define what the challenges are behind this, I thought it would be a good chance to start off with some audience interaction, which I'm sure we all appreciate first thing of a, of a morning at a, a recruitment event. So I wanted to, to play a game, uh, and we can play on uh, the tables, and it won't take long, uh, and it won't hurt, I promise you. Um, so here we have an example of a job ad that was posted to read.co.uk. I appreciate we all come from different um, recruitment sectors and recruiting for different roles, predominantly in tech, um, but bear with me. For this one, we have a business uh, and investment analyst role. I'll just read that top line for you. This role is crucial for the business and tasks must be carried out daily with the utmost accuracy to ensure FCA compliance. This position would have one direct report. So, on your tables, if I could just ask you to define what sector um, the, among the bottom four you feel that this would best fit in. So have a quick chat amongst yourselves, we'll spend 20, 30 seconds, and then come back and we'll show you where this job was posted. Please discuss. Say again. Okay, I can bring you back to the uh, bring you back to the presentation. How did we find it? Relatively painless. Having a little discussion with your with your colleagues and your, your co-members on your table. So raise your hand if you had this job down as in the accountancy sector. So that's one table. That is in fact where this job was placed. Now that doesn't mean to say that the rest of you are wrong, but what it does do is highlight the challenge that's at stake here. When you have a job title like this. It's very ambiguous in terms of those arbitrary 38 sectors where it should sit. So if this is a challenge for us as a room of recruiters, you can appreciate as a candidate how much of a challenge it is to find that job if that's the specific role that you're looking for. 
So this is where machines can help us uh, enhance that process. So here is uh, our first diagram for you, and this is a machine view of all of our sectors. So each of the jobs that you see on here, each of the dots represents a job, each of the colors represents a sector. Um, and where you see an overlap, it's where the machine, uh, as it were, can't understand the difference between the two jobs that are posted. And the only way it can tell it's in a different sector is, again, by human decision and human uh, interference, for want of a better term, in terms of defining that sector. And you'll notice as well there's a lack of white space here, which means there aren't very obvious clusters in terms of how things should be um, compartmentalised. It's, it's a really, really big challenge for us. Uh, to further that, you can see here in terms of the, all of the blocks here represent tens of jobs. And you can see, again, where it crosses over between the, uh, the different colours and the different sectors. So the classifications of jobs and candidates becomes harder because the content can get quite mixed up. And as a job seeker, you can register for accountancy, and then you might very well end up, by the current algorithm that we have in place, receiving a, a, a job alert for something that isn't actually what you're looking for, again, depending upon human decision as to how they've decided to, to tag that job. So as a job seeker, when searching for a financial advisor job, you might very well get results that are suggested to bookkeeping, for example. And as a recruiter, if you're looking for qualified accountants, in this example, you may very well find yourself with payroll administrators. And again, that's not really the the experience we want people to have with Reader UK. So why does this happen? Well, sectors can mean different things to different people. Um, classification in sectors is a very subjective process, as we've discussed. So we rely on a variety of factors, such as specific vocabulary we used uh, regarding categorization, and each person may interpret, interpret these things differently. They can represent an industry, a role, an occupation, or even an area of expertise. So often the process of categorising uh, content into sectors is subjective based on our prior knowledge and where we've come from and our own experiences. So why does Read at UK care about this as a big challenge? Well, our mission, as we touched upon, is to connect people with the right job, uh, which can be conversed into uh, Loving Mondays. And as part of this, it means providing an excellent searching and matching experience for all of our users, both candidates and recruiters combined. So our goals with this project, in terms of revamping the way we classify jobs, which can be referred to as taxonomy, is to provide a better user experience, to increase the level of quality and understanding of jobs and job seekers, and finally and eventually replace uh, sectors, those 32 arbitrary sectors that we saw at the top. So how does machine learning help? Well, machine learning can be used, as I'm sure some of us might be familiar with, um, to better, it can provide better techniques to understand, interrogate and organise data. Um, with machine learning, there's a form of, there's a kind of a, you can run it through what's termed as unsupervised learning. So this essentially means putting, inputting a whole bunch of data into a machine so it can categorise it for itself. And with that, the machine can understand and pull out certain trends that we might not have uh, recognised previously. And it can help us inform how to better classify thereon. Um, you'll often see visualisations like this one on the right, um, which is an indication of how we cluster data, um, which can prove really useful in terms of how we, again, make that clarity in terms of the categorisation that much clearer. Uh, with machine learning, there's a con a consistent decisioning and less subject subjectivity. So again, that kind of human interference, as we call it, which sounds a little bit dodgy now that I say it out loud, um, it doesn't take place when a machine's in control. Uh, the other benefit to machines, of course, is they get tired. They don't need to go home to their families. They don't need to go home to their Netflix to watch uh, Altered Carbon. So a machine can work uh, all the time. And so there's kind of, it, it does things that react a lot quicker and a lot more consistently. We can build richer and more structured data on jobs uh, and job seekers, increasing overall data quality. So again, by understanding certain trends, we can make them implicit and, and plug them in, and we'll, we'll give you a demonstration as to what we've done specifically on that area. And then finally, it scales really well. Uh, in terms of upscaling this to incorporate all the wealth of data that we have, particularly around jobs, all you need is additional hardware, which if you consider the advancements in cloud computing, it just makes it that much easier for us to scale one method that we know, if we can test and prove that it works, it upscales very, very easily for us. So, our new approach. Um, removing sectors, we have um, and inputting a bunch of data into the machine. Uh, we managed to find certain trends and define a new way of classifying jobs, which is around knowledge domains. So with the help of machine learning algorithms, we came up with the concept of these knowledge domains, uh, which we define as the required area of knowledge to fulfill an occupation. Again, that seems really straightforward, and we'll demonstrate what that means um, in, shortly. So even in terms of reducing those number of classifications, um, there are 13 knowledge domains as interpreted by the machine. 
I love that I'm using this for the machine. I sound a bit like Morpheus at the, um, in his speech in uh, The Matrix. That's a bit of a geeky reference. Um, so there are 13 knowledge domains versus 38 sectors, and there is significantly less overlap with these 13 knowledge domains than we see in the 38. So those kind of diagrams we took you through at the first instance won't happen, we hope, with the knowledge domains. So we talked about those 38 sectors, but how about the layer beneath that? Um, if you click onto a sector, as it is on Read at currently, you'll see a list of subsectors, and these are more or less the job titles we define that sit underneath that overarching sector. So if you thought 38 was quite a significant number, there are a total of 982 second level sectors. And again, all of these are manually curated. So it's up to us, or it becomes up to us, or again, human decision, to curate these and make sure they're up to date. Because as we all know, job titles can change very significantly over the course of even just a year, let alone you know, the, the entirety of the time that Reader Credit have been active for. So there are similar constraints uh, to top level sectors in terms of there's a lot of mixed content. Um, so how do we change that? How do we change that? Well, we attempt to model the job title. And I think that is ultimately what it comes down to. And when we rethought this whole process, it came down to understanding what the job title was, which is essentially building a richer occupational taxonomy. So we talked about job titles. Here is an example of one. And here's an example of how a machine might very well view that job title. You have here, in terms of that senior, that speaks to seniority. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, the second part is around occupation. Uh, this part here around the client, who it's for, again, that's very important data to us, but to the machine, that might necessarily be miscellaneous information in the first instance. Uh, annual bonus of the car announced can be defined as benefits. Uh, 45K speaks to salary, and finally, location. So if you can teach a machine to understand what these are and, and break them down, to make sure that it's a smooth and easy process to classify those job domains, you simply need to teach it the priority at which to extract that information. That was a hell of a sentence. Uh, I hope you're still with me uh, this early in the morning. So by teaching the machine the priority of which we wanted to extract that information, you can start to build that occupational taxonomy. So you've built an algorithm in terms of the algorithm being the priority of which to, uh, th how to pick apart the job title. And you can then pl plug in the job data that we have uh, and again teach it and just make sure that testing that machine, testing that uh, uh, machine learning and making sure that it's tracking as you want it to. So you teach the machine the learning algorithm with that curated job content, and you'll find a hierarchy in terms of your new taxonomy is born. Um, so occupation, sitting at the top, uh, and if a machine can identify that, it can identify that in one instance, you might well be a financial services individual, you go into ad, uh, advisor, and then so on and so forth. The key stage for us on stage four was about extracting that information, extracting that um, uh, that algorithm and making an API so that we could use this not only in terms of job information but plug it into the other areas of our site that are equally as important, such as how people use the app uh, and also the uh, recruiter information that we have too. So what does this new taxonomy look like? And hopefully this will be a really clear visual representation for you. So you have here an example of the knowledge domains of which there are 13 that we talked about. And so the knowledge domain of the job is based on its title, its description of the responsibilities and so on. Beneath that then sits the primary occup uh, occupation. So this is the specific job title of which the individual might be looking for. Beneath that sits the second level occupation. So it's understanding that actually there's a much richer, denser layer of information and, and job title uh, underneath that kind of first top line. Um, and it's important to acknowledge that because again, if you're trying to get people to find what they need that much quicker, it's important that the machine understands that to surface the correct results to that individual. There's even a third layer beneath that, and just to give you an example, because the text is quite small here, the journey of down the left-hand side might, be well, might very well be, you're looking for a job in financial services, you might very well choose to be an advisor. Uh, the second level occupation is a financial advisor, and an, an example of a third level occupation is an independent financial advisor. And that kind of makes sense, but it's, it's quite a, a, a dense layer, and it's, it's difficult to track unless you use that machine learning. Now, the key part for us, and in terms of where we can take it a step beyond just making sure people get to the right job, is the other layer of data that you can put on top of it. So this is inferred linked skills and other entities. So, for example, we know that if you have a qualification in a certain area, that might very well link back to a primary occupation uh, as a job path that you might not have previously considered. And it's gathering that data and inputting that that we can get a lot more sophisticated and a lot more accurate in terms of mapping out uh, a potential individual's career. Uh, and maybe people might be a loss in terms of where they want to, to take their, their career. We can provide information based upon what other candidates have experienced 
and match their expertise, not just their wants and their needs, to where they might very well be best suited. Hopefully that makes sense. I really hope I'm doing this stuff justice. So what about candidates? Ultimately, what is the benefit for our job seekers? Well, we've improved the, we're aiming to improve the candidate experience, of course. So candidates are aligned to the sectors based on their registration data. Uh, candidate preferences, as we know, can change over time. So we can make a user's journey dynamic based on the data they give us. So we wanted to then take a look at the kinds of data you can receive and how you might plug that on top of the occupational taxonomy we've just showed you. So there are several layers of data. There's explicit forms, whereby we gather the information very directly upon registration. Now these are crucial in some instances, but they can be a bit jarring in terms of they can be a bit of a turn off to the user experience. And you want to keep them as short and brief as possible. Uh, but they are, of course, crucial to the process. There's also implicit data, which is behavior driven. So we can start to build up an understanding of what jobs individuals have viewed, uh, what jobs they've shortlisted, and what jobs they've applied for. And again, we can gather that data to infer and match them with the correct job content. There's also contextual user profile information, which is the kind of very basic nitty gritty that Google Analytics might tell us, such as uh, what device they search on, when they're searching, how often they search, and how engaged they are in any particular job search. So again, we can really begin to tailor each individual's experience to what it is that they need. Um, and then you plug all this on in with our taxonomy. So not only are you doing all of the things on the left, but you're also plugging in the right job content as well. And ultimately, that's, that's what we're aiming for. So uh, the result is that both candidates and jobs can now be linked at a deep semantic level. Candidates can move between different occupations based on their implicit and their explicit data. And it's all performed automatically by the machine. There's not a huge amount of human interaction that needs to happen. And so it can just take place at a wide scale at any time. So to summarize, uh, we've looked at how we are using machine learning on a real business problem that Read at Code UK have. Uh, we can now infer a candidate's occupation at any stage of their Read at Code UK journey. We can also determine a job's occupation automatically at the point of posting, saving time for users. Uh, machine learning will help us remove a lot of the subjectivity and bias around, around the process. And finally, our data quality will be improved because of the frequency and accuracy of machine classifications. So it improves the searching and matching for all of our users. And that is my presentation today. Um, thank you all very much for listening.